Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Six Degrees of Association. It is my pleasure. We have today Kevin Horton, president of Horton Research. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. We got a chance to chat a little bit before the show, but I, I first want to let you, Kevin, introduce yourself and, and tell us maybe how you came a part of this uh, association industry. How did you find associations? Sure. I, I like to, at this age, uh, tell people that I was Doogie Hauser and now I'm old. Uh, <laughs> and when I was um, starting out in my career, uh, I left a PhD program in the University of Maryland. Uh, and I went to work for the federal government almost immediately and, you know, wore my short sleeve dress shirts for uh, two years. Uh, and, you know, got a little bit tired of that. And I just sort of, you know, tumbled into working for the National Association of Home Builders. I, I had no idea what an association was. Uh, I, I did take a course uh, in my grad program where uh, Mansur Olson, the author of a famous book in economics called The Logic of Collective Action, kind of gave me a sense as to what pressure groups were. I mean, it was written in the 50s, so that was kind of, uh, you know, yeah. how people thought of all of them back then. Um, but, you know, I, I really liked, uh, you know, what NAHB did. It had about 300 staff, you know, in downtown D.C. Really cool office, you know, all the real, you know, top-notch criteria you should be using when deciding what direction to take in your career. Um, but I enjoyed it. Uh, I had a big office on the ground floor and homeless people would wave to me at night, uh, you know, while I'd work late hours. And I just really enjoyed it. So yeah, I, I never really gave a whole heck of a lot of forethought into it. I just knew that it was paying about 25% more than my GS grade was. And that was good yeah. enough for me. And so then I just kind of tumbled into it and went from uh, job to job after that. So yeah, that sounds like a, a Washingtonian story, uh, you know, going to you Maryland, go Terps, and then uh, finding your way to government and into associations. That's that's perfect. Did did NAHB have you know two thousand board members back then? Also, isn't that the group that has one of those? That's, yeah, it's that certainly that could be did. its own episode. I, I, to, I think. Uh, oh yeah, I, I used to compare it to the Politburo. I don't know if they still have a Politburo, but back then, like <laughs> there'd be this massive hall, and of course, you know that that works as long as people keep their mouths shut. But at NAHB, uh, you know, people weren't exactly towing a line. They like to hear themselves talk as much as uh, any other, uh, you know, sort of self-made, uh, mostly man, uh, you know, entrepreneurial business people were. And I, I had no idea that NAHB was not a typical association until I went to go work for others, you know, uh, yeah. because, you know, NHB had so many cool directions you could go into. We had about 220,000 members back then, uh, right. you know, about uh, only a quarter of the members are builders. The rest are different kinds of service providers, uh, like subcontractors and title attorneys and all those kind of folks. And the other thing that was kind of funky about them was that they were a federation. So we had a network of what they called uh, BIAs or HBAs, home building associations or building industry associations. And so we had these uh, 800 um, organizations around the country. Usually, on average, they just have like one or two counties each that they were responsible for. Some of them liked us. Some of them didn't. Uh, I learned the old, uh, I'm here from Washington, I'm from Washington, and I'm here to help sort of thing, you know, just uh, by way of joking with them to try to win their trust or to tell them <laughs> I came from Idaho, so maybe, you know, maybe they could trust me a little bit more. But yeah, there I, you uh, go. I learned a lot of different things I didn't think I'd learn at that, at that point on, you know, how to interact with people uh, when you don't have any any real sort of power or authority. Uh, they were all independent groups, and you just had to make a good impression every time you talked to one. So, yeah. Were you doing Were you doing research for them back then, or, or when did you find your way into sort of the research channel or lane? Yeah, well, at, um, the great thing about associations is you can uh, be anybody you want to be, especially when they keep firing your bosses. And so in my yeah. case, I was in uh, housing policy. Uh, I was the, the guy who was there at 10 o'clock at night, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, photocopying things. And uh, when the VP of marketing saw me over across the way, uh, you know, she had a favorable impression. And when the job of uh, director of market research came open, she went ahead and hired me and then they fired her the, the next day. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting timing. I don't know if I'm the Flying Dutchman or a bad luck charm or what have you. Um, but of course, uh, almost immediately I did research plus, you know, helping with marketing uh, because we didn't exactly have a timetable and say, oh, so-and-so's uh, going to be leaving here abruptly tomorrow. Uh, and so right. I also worked makes with it them tricky. on a lot of their internal marketing communications. So uh, so I, I um, actually started out at that point doing both marketing and research and, and basically uh, did that for another probably 20 years or so uh, until eventually, you know, sort of I let the marketing side sort of, you know, fade away and just focused on research, especially for the past uh, 18 years I've been doing this, uh, this job. So, yeah. You know, I, I guess in research, what I found is there's, there's qualitative and there's quantitative. Do you, mm -hmm. I, I think the Horton, um, 
research I mean, you, you all focus on both. Like, do you have, do you lean one way or particularly the other? Uh, not really, um, because, I mean, just like with associations where you have to do what you have to do in your department, um, you know, in research as well, I find that if you don't do both in an engagement, you're probably selling yourself a little bit short. I think the client oftentimes has a, a really nice, um, you know, sort of institutional memory. And part of what, you know, quantitative does is it allows you to test that. There's a lot of hypotheses on how people feel, why things are the way they are. And so a typical engagement for us will consist of, you know, doing qualitative up front. I'm a big fan of in-person interviews. Uh, you know, we can't really do those anymore, haven't been able to for eons. Uh, right. but we still do, you know, telephone interviews. Uh, and focus groups have, you know, for me, kind of fallen by the wayside. I think there's a lot of posturing and things like that that go with it. And so for me, uh, you know, I learned so much more about a client in, say, you know, 10 or 12 interviews, you know, uh, understanding, you know, what people think is really going on, uh, cutting through the BS. We always guarantee complete confidentiality and therefore you know we ask for candor in return and so what happens is when people start telling their stories and you start to sort of put them end to end or or uh, you know just trying to make a little snowball out of all the little unique snowflake conversations you've had you come up with something that looks really surprising to the client a lot of times um, but what that does is then it sets us up because I do like to do them in that sequence it sets us up to be able to you know do a quantitative survey afterwards that doesn't just ask the questions that my client contacts want to ask, but also allows us to probe and really start to distinguish between these interesting you know, utterances people share with me where I'm trying to figure out, are they uh, the tip of the, of the iceberg and there's a lot more people who feel that way? Or is it a lone gunman who just uh, you know seems to have some really sort of interesting thoughts, but very, very few people in that profession or industry feel that way? So that was kind of a long-winded answer, making a short story long, but I do think that you, know, you have to have both most of the time. And so because I see them as both uh, necessary, I don't really like one more than the other. Although uh, I will add one more little detail. Uh, I do some of my research in bars, you know, and so uh, last uh, two weeks ago when I was explaining to someone, you know, just roughly what I did, she immediately came back with, oh my God, that must be so terrible because, you know, having to like, you know, follow a script and, you know, call random strangers and ask them things. I went, oh my God, she thinks that I work in a call center. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I went. No, actually, it's kind of the exact opposite. A lot of times, I'm interviewing CEOs with you know 30 plus years of experience in a field. They know everybody. They throw out a lot of jargon, and my job is to sort of nod and pretend like I understand all of it, so that we don't dwell on them trying to educate me. And it's actually probably the most challenging thing I do. So even judging from my uh, Shrek smile here, uh, I'm probably <laughs> thinking that that's kind of uh, you know <clears throat> a little more interesting than the survey work. But I do like eventually coming back down to finding out, yeah, were those people crazy or, or you know, is, is that a trend that my client had never really identified in their, their normal association work? So, yeah. Well, that was, that was worth the story. I, I, can't, I couldn't help but thinking, you know, you're talking about <clears throat> analyzing people and data and working through the BS and all that. I mean, I, are you consider yourself a good interviewer also? I mean, do you, when you're hiring folks, I mean, do you, have you learned to sort of pick through all that? You've done so many interviews. Uh, does it translate? I know that's sort of an offshoot of anything we were talking about. I just, it just jumped to me. Yeah, I mean, the two kinds of interviews, uh, it's been 18 years since I've actually had, like, real staff. I mean, sometimes I'll have, like, onesies and twosies uh, who, you know, work as, um, you know, assistants to me, uh, a lot of times interns, things like that. Um, but my last real day job, I was the head of development for Catholic Relief Services, uh, mm -hmm. which today is probably about a billion dollar or so organization, but I had about 15 staff, and I headed up their direct response fundraising. And I think back then what I found was really interesting is that I do cut through the BS a lot. And in fact, I have this sort of um, old hillbilly sort of mindset where I also don't trust people who have too much of a veneer. If they seem too smooth, I don't. I, I I immediately don't like them, right? But I also your, try to be your, objective. Your BS enough. meter goes off. <laughs> it's, it's like going off, man. And it's like you may be a great person underneath, but some at some point in your career, you really learn to try to like just layer it over so that I can't get through there. You're not you're not transparent at, at all. You're very opaque, and so you know, for me, trust takes a a little bit longer to get there. And I know that sounds crazy because most people go, "Oh wow, she comes off really well. We'd love to put her in front of the client." Well, you know, we weren't in that kind of job. We were, you know, we were. Trolls putting out uh, millions and millions of pieces of junk mail every year. So yeah. Well, no, I mean, I mean myself. I we're going a little bit of a tangent, but myself in, in interviewing people um, and 
prospect employees specifically is how do you you got to build that trust really quickly in order to really understand is that person giving you a genuine response or are they just giving you the veneer as you said and that's that's a skill it's a, it takes time to learn how to get somebody to tell you whether they're going to be terrible at the job or not uh, you know within within 45 minutes of just getting to know them because they've practiced and they're a lot of some of them are ready to just give you all the canned answers and so um, if anybody watches this later, or listens to this later, I'm, they're going to hear that I'm, I'm actually trying to just break down those walls early to try to get to the meat. So they're going to have their extra veneer up. But Well, I think the other thing that happens, too, is just to make sure, and, and this is a, an important lesson for association people, is that you have to learn uh, on which occasions you need to rely on the wisdom of the crowd, you know. And so, of course, you know, uh, hardly anyone ever goes through just a single interview with me back then. It would be the group interview, too. And so we do a, a debriefing afterwards, and I would compliment what I heard and what my gut was telling me with what their guts were respectively telling them. And, you know, we'd try to normalize them and try to figure out, oh, okay, wow, I totally missed that. So, yeah. Mm. Interesting. So we, we got we got sort of down the hiring track, but bring it back. I mean, tell us a little bit more about um, about Horton as an organization. What type of research are you guys focused on, and 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 maybe a little bit of how has that changed over the past decade, if it has. <laughs> Uh, there was a period where I've been doing this for 18 years. I um, gave about four months' notice to CRS so that they could ease me out neatly enough. And uh, right about then was when the uh, tsunami hit uh, Southeast Asia and killed 175,000 people. And so, like, we were on the news almost every day. I was in the office sleeping in a cot. You know, it wasn't exactly the smoothest transition. <clears throat> but after I, I left there, uh, they went ahead and uh, paid me a retainer to stick around, help uh, mentor my successor. Uh, and so I was actually doing at one time a mix, much more of a mix of marketing uh, and research. And uh, because part of my background from way back when uh, was serving as an account supervisor, almost on a, I guess, like a sabbatical, you know, between association jobs for the marketing agency, uh, Marketing General Inc., uh, I was very, it very much changed the way that I thought about the marketplace in general. And so I think that I had such a good finishing school, even back before I turned 30, I understood, you know, how associations worked. I understood where their limitations were. And so, you know, for any engagement, I just, you know, sort of adjusted to the reality of I would work with the folks that wanted to hire me. And I think over time, when you are a well enough known commodity, the people who might not fit you that well, don't even put you on RFP distributions and things like that. And so what I have found is that, you know, our work has been, you know, pretty, pretty standard for quite some time. Uh, every now and then serendipity leads us to uh, do different kinds of projects. And one thing that cropped up, you know, the PhD that I worked on was in labor economics, you know, and one day a client that got to know me, they said, well, why don't you do comp work? I, I don't get why you're, you know, just doing needs assessments and program evaluations and data mining and things like that. And I was like, wow, what a great, great idea. I hope people hire me to do it. And over time, you know, a lot of people have to where maybe 40% of my work is comp and benefits surveys, you know, okay. very quantitative, very different animal where you spend a lot of time cleaning data, making it intelligible and ensuring validity. And then, uh, you know, the rest of the work is a combination of, uh, you know, quantitative and qualitative, uh, like I was describing before, where, you know, typically the association is either about to embark on a strategic plan, uh, they feel like there's something awry with their membership in general, and they want to, you know, sort of do that, that temperature check and see if there are identified areas where they can start to sharply improve their operations. And so in all those, those areas, I, I sometimes think I'm doing the same thing day in and day out, uh, but I also get so many clients who come back on a weird cycle, you know, four or five years later. So I, I had someone who worked with me 12 years ago and said, hey, bub, what's going on? I was like, uh, I don't know, what do you want? And they simply <laughs> wanted me to redo what we did 12 years ago. And of course, I've got pretty good records. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, here's what I think worked well. Here's what I think didn't work so well. Um, but it's almost like cross-sectionally, um, every project is will be different in a meaningful way, but a lot, they are much more similar to each other than they are different, you know, so... Yeah, I, there is some of that that just sort of comes back un, unexpected, and, and I'm glad you had all the old notes. The, the worst case scenario that we've seen is you, know, you, you do something like that, then they, a couple of years later, either can't find you, don't find you, whatever it was, and 
uh, wanted to get a second opinion, and, and so they go somewhere else, and then they come back, and, and, and then you're looking at somebody else's you know half-eaten plate that uh, you know sort of dripped in between you and yourself, and, I, and we've been a big proponent of. You know, we'd like to get better with age um, through a through a longer term partnership, and so why don't why don't we set something up where we can, you know, we can do something every two years or every year, or let's check in quarterly on each other, and um, you get smarter. In my experience, building on your own data set than you do on somebody else's. Maybe you learn something, but it, it takes a long time to sort of untangle the methodology of of, an, of another firm. And then you're you're left sort of battling the validity of their process in general or, or the output of their data. So um, I tend to like to try to keep them close and we can we can build it together as long as it's working for everybody. You know, why stop? I, I was kind of weird in a different way um, starting out uh, on this side, because, like I said, I, I had worked for Marketing General. In fact, after I left them and went back to the association world, I uh, continued to do a lot of research projects quietly, weekends, evenings type stuff. And so, like, I had seen a, a nice cross-section of different associations. and But I always found that there was a great deal of strength in terms of exactly what I do in working with a variety, you know. And so I've had the good uh, fortune, for example, of doing a couple of projects for a SAE. Uh, in each case, you know, conducting surveys amongst like, you know, say 50 associations at a time that, you know, they would work with us to recruit. And so over the years, I've worked with maybe 450 associations, especially in the past 18 years. And I think that that includes a few of the old MGI holdovers. But I yep. always like to be able to sit down. If a client said, hey, you know, we work in early childhood ed, you know, who have you worked with in this area? And I go, oh, blah, 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 you know, I give them like two or three. And so from a business development standpoint, it helped a lot. So in my early years, when someone would say, hey, we'd like to hire you again, I said, how about not? And why don't you work with somebody else and then come back to me? I, I like your analogy of the half-eaten plate. But, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily want to keep working with the same clients over and over again, especially if uh, the results were going to be about the same. And I was always kind of concerned that, you know, our methods and our questions might be different enough to where they really would benefit from use, working with someone more orthodox or traditional or what have you, and at least have Having sort of being able to tell to what degree observer bias has something to do with the kind of response they're getting. So, yeah, that's not not a bad point. I mean, there is there can be some power in diversity if you're looking at it um, maybe from a change of perspective. Um, there can be some inherent bias in, in keeping the same consultant tied to it. But again, you, you just sort of have to change out the lens, change the positioning, look at the look at it differently to keep it keep it fresh. Um, and then you do have to be a little bit patient. You, you, I get the sense in, in maybe in those earlier days, you were a little bit of more of a man of variety. Is that fair? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I've come to appreciate the the checks, you know, um, a little bit more. So, you know, at the time I was like, man, as long as I can make more than uh, I did before as an association exec, I'll be okay. And then I started setting my sights a little bit higher and said, well, as long as I make more than my last CEO, then I'll be okay. Uh, you know, sort of like just in terms of benchmarking it. And once I got to that point, not to say I got selfish or anything, but, you know, because my, my prices have always been pretty pretty moderate. I don't want uh, price to be a stumbling block. Um, but then when a friend of mine on uh, collaborate not too long ago said hey guys you know to the association world don't throw out the the highest and the lowest bid and then talk to the ones in the middle and i was like oh, that's a thing you know it's like i would have been the low bid in a lot of cases and i was like why didn't they you know why didn't they hire me and and so i'm you know probably not very bright in the sense of like not asking you know holistically around enough to understand how people do things but you know i i i just try to keep doing better and of course you know like i said if uh, you know the volume that we're putting out is sufficient to pay me well then I'm a happy camper. So there you go. What um, switching gears, what, what is that, that one piece of research or that one project that is just really underutilized in your opinion in the association market? Like more associations should be doing what if I, if I asked you to fill in the blank? Oh, to market feasibility, um, you know, understanding their feasible universe, uh, drilling down, not into, I mean, you know, when you think about it, like a, a, I had an old a research professor where I can't do his voice or anything, but, uh, you know, his point was very well taken, which is that, um, you know, guy sees a drunk, you know, looking under a light a light pole, you know, at uh, 2 a.m. and comes over and says, hey, can I help you, sir? What's wrong? He goes, I lost my keys, you know, and it's like, okay, well, where do you lose your keys? He goes, about a block and a half over that way. He goes, well, why are you looking here? And he goes, the light. 
lights better, you know? And yeah. I think a lot of people actually, you know, do their research where the lights better. And, and I mean, I've done enough projects that are more commercial in nature where people, you know, sort of, they're, they're in the catbird seat, you know? You've got a captive audience. Uh, you can count on like 30% response rates unless you really screw it up, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, it's not perfect. It's still descriptive statistics, but it's still got pretty good explanatory power. But what I think a lot of times people do is they kind of violate that trust. And, you know, most of the time I, I'll offer, I'll say, look, for just a little tiny bit more, I'll go ahead and survey, you know, your non-members that you've got on file. No, that's okay. We just want to find out what our members think. And I'm like, okay, well, that's great. So like uh, in the old days when everybody sort of, one of the few times associations proactively jumped the curve is when they went from print to digital. Of course, yes, I'm very old. So that was a long time ago. But, you know, a lot of people looked at that and said, wow, look at this. We're going so green here. Well, you know what? For the 20% of people that you greatly upset by taking away what they thought was their one tangible benefit, well, they left you over time. And so if right. you just went ahead and surveyed the cross-section of your population a few years later and said, hey, look at that. We were right. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, everybody <laughs> prefers uh, electronic now. Well, yes. Yeah, you've kind of trained them to to accept it. And you've also driven off the people who are hardcore paperheads, you know. And so right. I always, you know, sort of use that still as an old-fashioned example where because what you're doing is you're focusing on what you think is your core population, the people you really need to hear from, you're missing the big picture. And I think that same principle also applies to the over-reliance that most executive directors and CEOs have on, you know, sort of polling their board or a committee as a proxy for in lieu of understanding the cross-section of the membership. And I think that the biggest problem is, you know, people always, you know, do feasibility for projects and programs and things like that. And they go, God, I just don't understand why it flopped. Well, you weren't asking the right people whether they'd use it. You ask the people that you trust most, and they might even sort of want to pull their punches because you're clearly very enthusiastic about this idea. There's there's a lot of human reasons why people tend to sort of look at the inner circle, but of course, look how far that got Putin in, in you know, Ukraine. It's uh, uh, sometimes you do have to actually listen to dissenting voices and also try to understand how indifferent people feel about things as well. So it, it's you know it's so true um, that often you see associations who are very top heavy, you know, with their membership revenue, and that's where they go, right? And sometimes that inner circle is. A, a couple handfuls of people or maybe one handful of people mm -hmm. and and you survey those folks and you talk to them because you trust them as you said but they're not the ones that you need to buy the programs you need the other 90 percent of the membership to buy the programs and that's why you invested and if you had done that if you had listened you know to the to the outer limits you you probably would have been more successful right Right. I, I think the other thing that um, you know we used to encourage folks to do, but nobody ever did, uh, was to create a panel. You know, I mean, if you really need, I mean, if the thing that the board uh, offers you is they're here, you know that they're going to be meeting next Tuesday. Uh, let's go ahead and ask them a few questions. Sort of, it seems like a very reasonable thing for uh, you know an ED to say, "Hey, this would be a great opportunity for you." And it's yeah, it's a great opportunity to hear from people who either like you or hate you, and very few fall in between. Now, what you probably should be doing is trying to recruit a panel of, you know, a few hundred people, intentionally including, you know, you know, younger people, diverse people, people who are very unengaged otherwise, because, you know, when I talk one-on-one, -on -one, I always insist on doing uh, the help desk, you know, the, the service work uh, for all of my clients, uh, so that not only can I help them if they have a problem with the survey, I can address it just like that instead of waiting for it to go through, uh, you know, their member service program or whatever. Um, but the other thing that I'll do is I'll go ahead and just ask them, you know, sort of point blank, is like, well, was this easy? Was it hard for you to do? You know, that kind of thing. And so we'd always find like micro tweaks that we could actually implement. Um, but by simply yeah. asking the question at the right time, people will tell you the stuff that otherwise you know you need to know, but you never hear otherwise. And one of the things that comes up all the time is if you do um, an analysis of response and you look at what the characteristics are of people who responded at a higher than average clip of your overall audience, and then you look at people who are underrepresented, it's usually students, it's new members, it's all these kinds yeah. of people. When I have conversations with them and say, well, uh, you know, 
why did, why do you not want to answer the survey? Well, I'm new and I don't have anything to share. And it's like, well, you're exactly the person I want to hear from. But of course, I can't encourage everybody. I can just encourage the ones who proactively write me and say, for whatever reason, hey, I don't want to do this survey. I, I don't know why people do that. I'm, most people just push the delete key. So yeah. Maybe people, a lot of people are short-sighted. I would say on both sides of the coin, you're, you're short-sighted to please those that are the here and now and, and paying the money. They've, they've risen to the top and they're on the board. Um, and it's short-sighted to not listen to the students and the young members um, because they're going to be the voice that, that writes what the industry looks like 15 or 20 years from now. And so you have to look at kind of both puzzle pieces and weigh where you want to go with, you know, with those funds. I mean, with, with your time and your resources and everything. And I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's situational. Uh, but there's certainly a time to be listening to the younger demographic and all of the associations who are now clamoring over and going, how do we attract younger demographics? Well, you listened to them 15 years ago. but mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> go get your uh, hot tub time machine and go find them. Yeah, so right, best time to plant a tree twenty years ago. <laughs> Same idea. Yeah. Well, we 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 talk to you know associations who are are looking to you know monetize research. Right, um, we look at associations who are looking to save money. I, I I shared a story with you. There's an association. This was probably going back a decade or so now. Who. Uh, doing some analysis on a list and, and wanted to, you know, at, the, at the start of an engagement on a project and said, you know, we're, we're really just not, it was a marketing initiative and that they wanted to see how they could do better at marketing, how they could increase their engagement. This was at the, at the start of a decade a year ago when engagement was like the hottest word ever and you know, everybody was trying to figure out what it even meant and how do you <laughs> quantify it and all of this. And hey, fast forward a couple of weeks into the project and go back to them and, and um, you know, hey, we're, we're early stage here in the project, but we've already found, found about a half million dollars of savings. Great. I mean, I had savings. That, that wasn't even our intent. We were really just trying to figure out where we can invest our next dollar in engagement. They said, no, 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 no problem. They said, well, great. Well, how do we do that? And the answer was you, you stop sending direct mail four times a year to your dead members. <laughs> it was, it's the lowest bar of, of – um, uh, of some analytical research, as you will, for for saving money. But I mean, I want to. Do you have Do you have some examples, Kevin, in your world where we're using today clients of yours or past clients that are using research and quality quant to you know, save money, increase non dues revenue, those type of things. Well, I'd love to tell a more positive story. I will tell a story from one of my past jobs where um, we we had a, a firm come in and, you know, we had done like maybe four years worth of acquisitions, reaching out to every Catholic we could find in the planet to uh, be a donor. And we put all that file, all those files together and we determined, you know, how often we had reached out to each one of them. And it was very much a model driven approach to prospecting in the in the charity world, uh, unlike in associations, uh, associations associations will not spend very much money on recruiting members. They think they do, um, but oftentimes uh, they reach out to far too few people. They think of them as purely hot leads if they are, you know, doing high cost per contact, you know, right. phone work, mailing, etc. Well, you know, in a charity, you don't have much choice. You do have to mail. And of course, the USPS gives you, you know, nice breaks on your postage and things like that. Um, but the point that we had was that we were reaching out to about 10 million people with all of our activity. There's 80 million people or households who identified as Catholic in the country, excuse me, 80 million people. There's only about 110 million households in the country. But we were totally looking at this top down and then asking ourselves, okay, well, let's look at the 30. And like I used to tell my staff, you know what? The 31st time is probably not the charm. These are hardcore non-responders. And you're blowing a boatload of money on renting names, sending them another piece of mail, and so what I would go, go down to is that the, the power of research is nothing compared to the power of doing data-driven work to reach outside your universe. Um, uh, in, in 2000, uh, the year 2000, I remember because you know, it was a momentous year, Y2K, all that kind of thing, uh, right. I worked with ASAE to do a survey where we were looking at the um, effect of uh, consolidation, mergers, and acquisitions on the universes of trade associations. Uh, I was somewhat concerned being a VP for the National Association 
association of chain drug stores at that point as to, you know, how do we sort of main, maintain our market share and ensure that we're still doing well when all the regional chains were being gobbled up by the Rite Aids, you know. And, and what struck me at the time is how few associations even knew what their universe was, how few, uh, so, you know, this is, was only trades because we wanted some homogeneous, you know, uh, you know, peer-to-peer sort of comparisons to make. Right. But I was really shocked by how few actually seem to have an active prospecting program. Uh, you can do all the research in the world, and I think that, you know, the example I used before, you know, uh, surveying both, you know, current members and former and non-members at the same time, you know, in other words, the people who are kind of the least captive in your database is really kind of a lame first step to really having your finger on the pulse for why do those other people not join? How many are there? What's what's their value? You know, what's their possible value? If we could convert five or ten percent of them, you know, and so I think a lot of times, you know, uh, my clients don't really use, uh, and this I'm not a good answer for your question, I realize, um, but, you know, a lot of uh, associations just don't leverage, uh, you know, research very well, which is why yeah. a lot of them sit and wait four or five years before they contact me again. Because, well, you know, you check the box off, you did what the board wanted or, or what was in your in your uh, performance plan for the year, you know, and yeah. you're done, you know. So, yeah, I, I very few cases stand out in my mind where, you know, we did research and then we found a way to save money. Because even in your example, what you were citing is that, hey, we found out these people were dead. You do that through an overlay, you know. Uh, you don't, you know, necessarily survey and say, are you alive? Yes or no. I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. That would be quite the survey. Yeah. It'd probably have a response rate of zero for one segment, I'm thinking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and then and you were saying, you know, in the year 2000, doing the, you know, the acquisition analysis. And here we are, you know, fast forward 20 years. And acquisitions in the market are seemingly only accelerated, right? And so mm-hmm. maybe time to redo that one uh, you know, t- two decades yeah. later. It's a, it's a different type of environment. Yeah, I'm a longstanding member of uh, Calis AE, and I always do a lot of their research, especially the more complicated stuff. Uh, and a number of years ago was the last time I actually did a, you know, sort of like a benchmark. I, I hate to o- misuse that word. Benchmarking means best practices, not common practices. But when we did a survey of common practices of member acquisition amongst California associations, and I had done one similar to that a couple of years before, you know, with ASA and the listserv and, and around the country that maybe 300 people, uh, you know, answered – and what I found in my shock, it's a little different than what MGI does with their, you know, annual survey. We were asking questions that were open-ended. How many people do you reach out to? What would you estimate is your your total, you know, marketing budget? What's your cost per contact? And you know what? Uh, the only people who answer that kind of survey are the ones who actually know what they're talking about. Um, but what I right. found kind of shocking, though, was that, um, you know, the, the, the overall things we were finding is that as a ratio of the total membership, um, the largest... Uh, you know, acquisition efforts were being undertaken to an audience of maybe 5% of their total membership. Uh, their populations were rarely more than a couple of thousand. Their cost per unit of contact, because the quantities were so low, were on the order of 3 and $4 each. And even though, you know, they were getting great response rates and they were very proud of them, you know, the problem is you don't reach out to much of your... F- you know, potential universe, you get a good response rate, but you only focus on your hot leads, then what happens is you, you're doing these things that feel good, but they only add like a few hundred members a year. And it was just kind right. of demoralizing. But even sharing that kind of information, nobody cares. I mean, yeah, it's like, well, yeah, that's what we do. I, I don't have a bigger budget. What, you want me to reach out to four times as many people and, you know, include losers in the distribution? Well, no, not really. But, you know, you should reach out to more. So, yeah. But you have to hit the quantities. I, I too share the frustration that the certain segment or s- certain associations will restrict the budget for for new members, or even will have say some that say I don't want to grow. Okay, mm-hmm. well, all things, all healthy things grow. First of all, right. um, and and why not? I, I in I, I sort of had a conversation recently where I was likening associations to you know like online influencers. And you think about online influencers, what are they? They're, they're solely uh, really driven by one thing. How many people can, they, can I get to follow me, right? Because then the monetization of the content or the advertiser, whatever it is, goes up. So why are not more associations following Team Suit? In fact, the, one of the, I'll say, richest people on YouTube, and I only know this because I have two like, young teenage kids, is this guy, Mr. Beast. And, and he's put out a video that says, Oh, I was I was making millions of dollars at some point on my videos, and I would I would spend a million dollars on the next video. I'd make a million, and then I'd spend a million, 
And, and why would you do that? Why wouldn't you put some in your pocket? He said, because I knew when I got to a bigger volume that I could make more money. He's like, I could stop making you know, new stuff today or I could, I could spend half of what I spend on getting more followers and, and make tons of money. But I, that's not why I'm here. Right? I, I'm, I'm reaching more audience. I'm, I'm having more impact. And, and in, through that strategy, he's now come as you know, he's like a billion dollar you know, enterprise because of it. And he the idea like that associations to do the same thing. Yep. Dump into it. Yeah, you might talk to a few losers, and you might actually get a few losers to, to join up on membership. But who knows who else you're going to be gathering in the mix that you know, through acquisition or other means uh, eventually grow and monetize or, or you bring in the right set of sponsors and, and so forth. So. Right. I, I never know if it's, um, if, uh, it's just serendipity. Uh, I mean, oftentimes I, I kind of laugh because I've got some competitors who will – I see in their reports because I'm sure we see each other's work. I'm doing secondary research before we get started, and they oftentimes will say, hey, here's your net promoter score compared to 40 other associations. And I always kind of laugh because in a universe of 27,000 associations of any real size you know, uh, that are probably in your in your sort of peer group you know i might work with an impressive number over the course of my career but it is a drop in the bucket you know and, and so i always feel like when people ask me for real trends is like I, I can tell you observationally what i'm seeing from a, a particular association or two but right now i do have two associations who both have the same issue the influencers in social media have far larger followings than they do as an association and it's starting to gnaw at them you know they're in dermatology and beauty and so for them you know these are very faddish things and yet you know what happens is they don't have a fraction of that membership that an influencer has as a following and so right. what happens is whatever that influencer says becomes sort of common sense for the industry or for the field and what they say you know for dower well researched etc is not doesn't have near the legitimacy in the public uh, which is a very difficult lesson unless you learn how to co-opt and encourage or act like an influencer or yourself yeah so so to you when, when you when you say that or you see that does that disparity does that ring bells as, as a lagging indicator to associations maybe not being as relevant because there's a younger demographic typically focused on the following uh, of somebody individually versus their industry advocacy champion uh, the association the well, relevance is a funny thing. Um, you know, uh, you know the road to relevance and the race for relevance. I forget what the prepositions were in the big, uh, middle of those titles, um, but they, you know, tended to highlight the importance of being relevant to your constituency. You know, right. uh, the problem is if you're trying to be relevant to the world, that is um, so much larger of an issue. It doesn't have as neat a metrics. It can feel like you're throwing the, you know, sort of the message in a bottle out there to, to everybody, and they don't necessarily see like a direct sort of line back to okay, how does that help us? Now, I think the key has always been that advocacy is still, uh, you know, sort of a cigar-filled room sort of thing where you just need to sort of – you may not be pushing wheelbarrows of cash, but you do have very well-educated people who are then helping educate legislators and regulators, you know. So you could sort of focus on this tiny world and not have to worry about all the people who vote for them, for example, you know. Uh, sure. And so I do think that that's how, you know, we've always approached things where, you know, by reduction, like, a, you know, a good ED has a great relationship with the board, knows exactly who they are, but may not know a whole lot about really almost any other members, you know. Uh, a person who is a, a top GR person knows everybody on their particular committee. They know how to influence them. They know how they voted and everything thing else but that's in lieu of having to sort of deal with uh, the unwashed masses and i think that is a a big um you know sort of weakness of most associations because the ones that we all know w well are things like aarp or the nra and you know those aren't always positive you know connotations so i i'm interested to see and i'm you know something i just sort of watch from a distance if we, if we'll start to see at some point and may not be the same thing but some of these influencers work their way into associations where they could influence the larger industry from an advocacy perspective and sort of see the you know the Ronald Reagan approach of you know coming from stardom to presidency you know you this Instagram influencer you know rise to the ranks to ED or something um, and sort of how would how would that play out do they bring an audience do they bring sort of a, a charm if you will um, to the role 
Right. But I'll bet that that um, – <clears throat> I would say that actually sort of happens already because when you think of uh, – who's the big dude that boxes occasionally? Jake Paul, I think his name is. You know? Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. if you think about him and he's got – you know, the, the movement that, you know, YouTube, for example, has gone, you know, toward having uh, not just, you know, likes and subscribers but, you know, having subscriptions, you know? I mean, sure. I would say that there's probably not a whole lot of difference between more of an affinity-driven association and the people who pay money to uh, – <laughs> Even only fans. I mean, you know, I think about these different groups where, you know, and, you know, they're probably not attracted in the latter case uh, by whatever the, that person is thinking as a celebrity. They're probably driven by visuals and stuff like that. But I still think that, like, all of these celebrities probably don't need to move into an association role because that's got consensus. It's got a lessening of the power and control you have. It's not a direct connection that you have between yourself and your constituency. And I would say that most social media influencers actually have pretty good relationships with a large constituency that's larger uh, or at least equal in size to a, a typical association. So, Yeah, I mean, Jake Paul, for example, has got a lot of influence. I haven't, I haven't seen him testify before Congress yet, so I can't speak to his <laughs> ability to uh, promote advocacy, but maybe, maybe time will tell, Kevin. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Well, I, I, Kevin, I could, I, we could chat all day. Uh, somebody who's got the... Uh, the scholarly brains that you do you're a lifelong learner i know multiple um you've gone back for multiple degrees and you've got the brain of of a quant researcher um, but i could also love to see you on stage uh, you've got the personality for a qual so that's a compliment because uh, not all not all researchers you know have the two qualities at one so they, they kick well me done. off when i try to get on stage they kick me off all the time it's it's embarrassing so <laughs> i'd go watch let me know when you're uh when you're back in vegas and you've made a show and uh you'll be on stage i'll, I'll fly out there and come watch okay. it for the laughs anytime sounds good but uh i i do have to to wrap us up and and leave something out there for books to um, tell, tell me a little bit where they can where they can go to find you. Oh, it's uh, uh, HortonResearch.org uh, is my website. Uh, that's probably the best place to find me since uh, most of my, uh, as we talk about social media, most of my web presence are just where you can hear what I think about Ukraine and things like that. It's nothing that actually feeds my business. But I've I've been lazy, um, you know, because uh, over the years, you know, I, I used to speak quite a bit. I used to be on a lot of stages. Um, but at a certain point, especially to take care of my dad before he died and taking care of my mom, uh, she's alive, uh, regrettably, but she's uh, still out there. Uh, and, you know, I took kind of a 12-year break from D.C. and then just moved back to D.C. not long ago uh, to split my time, you know, half time. Um, but for me, as uh, you know, most people used to find me at the podium and I've built enough of a clientele where if I, you know, just attract more people by speaking again, uh, you know, I just wind up telling people no or referring them to someone else. And so I'm kind of at an equilibrium now for years where inertia kicked in and I'm always happy to talk to new people. But, you know, I'm not disappointed if they don't hire me, too. So... That sounds like a good place to be. Well done, sir. Um, well, as we as we uh, end all shows, we'd love to hear if you have a referral up your sleeve and somebody that you think our audience would benefit from hearing from. Sure. Well, uh, the person that occurred to me was uh, Mickey Rops. Uh, we have um, had uh, conversations the last couple of days on uh, collab on ASAE's Collaborate. Uh, she used to be our representative of. She used to be the queen of uh, consultants uh, a couple <laughs> of years ago as our representative to the uh, key committee that represents industry partners. Uh, she is like sort of the guru of uh, certification programs. Has written a couple of textbooks for ASAE, and she's based in Indianapolis, Indiana. So. Excellent. Look forward to speaking with Mickey. Certifications are a hot deal right now because, um, you know, formal, formal uh, education, past graduate, high school graduate seems to be on the outs uh, for, yep. for some. And um, so certifications, next best thing. So that's, that is very interesting right now. Thank you for that. And a pleasure having you, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure being had. I appreciate it.